to evacuate. Speaking to survivors months later, Hussein, as the shock of the storm wears off, the anger and calls for accountability comes in, feeling the evacuation came a little too late. Should we have taken it more seriously, of course, but they should have related to us a lot sooner and a lot and more desperation, like, hey, guys, leave. In fact, our Fox 4 investigation revealed Lee County leaders did not follow their own evacuation plan, which according to storm surge probability models could have come as early as 11 p.m. Sunday night. Those evacuations didn't come until 7 a.m. Tuesday morning. So what's the point of having a plan if it's laid out in black and white, but then we don't adhere to it? That's a place to start. That's not the final decision point. Lee County leaders admitting there will be lessons learned after Ian and their messaging will be changing this hurricane season. We're always compelled to take a look at, at everything that happened, the entire timeline, all the decisions made to work on uh, getting better for the next time. This while there are also lessons to be learned for all of us, as explained by Stacy Verdream. I just think by telling this story, if we can save one person's life, um, then that means everything. Speaking to us days after her uncle Mike was named as one of the 149 lives lost. His body found two days after Ian hit on Matt Lachey. He was found in the water. Stacy sharing his story for a reason. There is a message here that you wanted to share and sharing your uncle Mike's story. People will hear this and see this and you know the people who live in Florida might think twice. Um, and hopefully evacuate the next time a hurricane is coming our way um, so other family members don't have to go through this. And these really are some of the hardest lessons that many in our community had learned. As for the lessons learned from Lee County leaders, Lee County's manager said that the county is working on an after Ian action report, and part of that will be better messaging and public communication ahead of this storm season. Now, if you want to hear more about our findings of this seven-month-long investigation, just scan that QR code on your screen. Go to the evacuation on fox4now.com. Also, one of the lessons we learned during Hurricane Ian was the way we read forecasts and how those can be refined. Now, leading up to Ian and then the days after, leaders have said that Ian's shifting cone, which looks like this, they said that it was difficult to track. 48 hours they were on the periphery. Cone is 72 hours before the storm. We still were not in the cone. Um, Lee County wasn't. But the cone, as explained by National Hurricane Center specialist Robbie Berg, explained that it doesn't show a complete picture of the storm's impact. Well, now we know that. It really just shows where the center of the storm is headed. And as we know, when we have a storm as large as we did with Hurricane Ian, those impacts spread much farther than that center line. The cone is just where the center of the storm might move. It says nothing about the winds of the storm. It says nothing about the storm surge. And for instance, when Hurricane Ian was tracking toward Tampa, <clears throat> the outside of the cone that you see here was still touching Lee County's barrier islands and all of Charlotte County was inside of the cone. But with a storm like Ian, more than 100 miles wide, even if the eye did go over Tampa directly, people in southwest Florida would still feel the impacts, including deadly storm surge. Cuyahoga County was never in Ian's forecast cone, but still had 6 to 10 feet of surge because of it. That's why National Weather Service meteorologist Daniel Noah said it's important that we look at all all of the available data and potential impact instead of just where the center of the storm is tracking. People need to break up with a cone. As you're planning this season, it's also critical to remember that the surge, the wind and the rainfall that come with the storm can reach far beyond the eye and can be devastating, even if we're not directly hit again. As if on cue, we're also watching a new tropical depression that's working its way through the Gulf. So we'll bring in Fox 4 certified meteorologist Katie Walls with the latest. That's right. We have tropical depression number two, which officially formed at 5 p.m. Hurricane hunters were flying through it this afternoon and basically determined that it did indeed have a distinct center of circulation. That said, your takeaways are simple. Impact here will be minimal. It's going to stay offshore. We don't have any watches or warnings along the coastline, so it's going to stay away. It's also going to be short lived. So even though we are anticipating it to become tropical storm Arlene tonight into tomorrow, it's expected to maintain weak tropical storm strength, barely a tropical storm tomorrow. Then over the southern Gulf, it will be encountering very strong wind shear, which will help to further 
dissipated, basically helped to kill it off. So by the time it heads into the southern Gulf right over western Cuba this weekend, it's expected to be a remnant low, which is why our impacts here in southwest Florida will be minimal. We'll continue to see these thunderstorms enhanced. Basically, our classic afternoon storms just a bit more intensive, a bit more rainfall associated because of that Gulf moisture coming in. Now let's take a look at one of those downpours which just developed right over Port Charlotte, nearly stationary, and this is an example of one of those storms that could easily produce a quick one to two inches in the rain gauge. Same story from Alva to LaBelle, right along State Route 80 and farther inland to Moorhaven as well as Clewiston, right here in this part of Glades and Northern Hendries where we do have a flood advisory currently in effect because of excessive rainfall here over the last hour. We'll talk more about this threat as we head into the weekend coming up next. All right, Katie, thank you. And even though impact from tropical depression number two will be limited for us, that might not be the case next time. During Hurricane Irma back in 2017, leaders evacuated most of the people on our coast because of the predicted storm surge between four and seven feet. But that storm surge didn't come back then. However, as we know with Hurricane Ian, meteorologists predicted between 10 and 13 feet of storm surge, and that could hit our coast in the worst case scenario situation. Hours later, this is what we saw in our coastal communities. There is a saying, run from water, hide from wind. During Hurricane Ian, we saw exactly why that message is so important. And most of the 149 confirmed deaths from Ian came from people who died in the water. People who stayed inland faced plenty of wind, which did cause plenty of damage, but not nearly as deadly as the impact of the water. I thought maybe we were going to get washed away. That flood water sweeping away cars, boats, entire homes. Experts say storm surge reached as high as 13 feet in some parts of Lee County and also making meteorologists worst case scenarios a reality. The National Hurricane Center's goal over the next few years is to rethink how the public ultimately sees forecasts and models. Those experts tell Fox 4 meteorologist Andy